Well, a, a point of no return depends on different processes. So sea level is one of the big issues, ice sheets. If ice sheets begin to disintegrate and slide down a slope toward the ocean, then you've hit the point of no return. You can't stop the process. And that's very hard to say exactly when we get to that point with regard to ice sheets. There are other tipping points with regard to species extermination because, again, these are nonlinear processes. In the case of species, one species is dependent on others. So if you cause some of them to go extinct, you can reach a point of no return and you're going to lose many species. Well, I, the idea of setting targets for 2050 or even 2030, I think, is a cop-out because the politicians who set those targets won't be around at that time. So you have to look at what do we actually have to do in order to meet those targets. And as soon as you look at the magnitude of the fossil fuel reservoirs, oil, gas, and coal, you quickly come to the conclusion that we have to phase out quickly the coal emissions because oil and gas are such convenient fuels, they're owned by countries which are obviously going to sell them, but they're limited in amount. Coal is much larger and because the lifetime of carbon dioxide is so long, the only way we can solve the problem is eliminating a large fraction of the fossil fuel emissions and the obvious candidate is coal. Well, unfortunately, it seems that Congress and politicians are influenced more by special interests than they are by concerns about what our children and grandchildren are going to be faced with. We have to somehow draw attention to this. So far, the political process has not seemed to work. I mean, it's one man, one vote, but in Washington, money counts. Uh, and we're not getting the needed actions, even though it has become quite clear. And young people were very much involved in this last election, and they expect the new elected officials to take actions, but so far, Congress itself is continuing to burn coal to uh, provide their power. It doesn't make sense. The problem is that the way cap and trade is designed, it's extension of the Kyoto Protocol approach, and there are escape valves. So you set a target for emission, reducing your emissions, but then you can have some offsets. You plant a tree someplace, or you invest in a developing country to try to improve their uh, energy infrastructure. But in fact, if we look at how well that worked, killed all. It, it didn't work. Even the countries that took the strongest targets actually increased their emissions. And they did it by buying um, rights from developing countries like China, but China's emissions increased exponentially. You see, that's actually the advantage of a fee and dividend or tax and dividend. If you give 100% of that money back to the public on a per capita basis, then the person that does better than average in reducing his carbon emissions will actually make money. And it's a progressive tax. The person who has a big house and two Hummers will pay a lot more in tax than they get back in the dividend. So it's not, it's in fact, it would be the fairest way for the small person. The carbon tax would. The carbon tax. It's a case where we have not communicated well because the carbon price to solve the climate problem also solves the energy independence problem. And especially if you're giving the money back to the public on a per capita basis, I'm sure the public would support this, but it has to be properly explained to them. That's why we need a leader who will do that.
That's what I say. We're waiting for a Winston Churchill. We're waiting for somebody who will explain the problem that we face. We, we can't continue to appease the fossil fuel companies, which is what we're doing with business as usual. We have to look out after the best interests of the people and the young people and future generations. That requires being honest about this problem. If we put a price on carbon emissions, but then give the money back so that the public will have money to stimulate the economy and to buy the highly efficient products that reduce their carbon emissions, then it's good for the economy, it's good for our energy independence, and it's good for the climate, and it's good for our children. That could be explained. Uh, we haven't done a good job of explaining it. Now, I think, I'm hoping that President Obama will understand that and, um, and help explain it to the public, because there are multiple benefits of that kind of approach.